I said this morning that the general structure of, of this two-day workshop is to spend the first day primarily with expert speakers and the second day on journalist-to-journalist -journalist conversation. But for our afternoon keynote, we're lucky enough to have someone who, uh, in whom both of those cross collide intersect and are hopelessly intertwined. Uh, and that's Jose Antonio Vargas, um, who just told me, which I didn't know up until now, that he started as a reporter in this city covering homicide at the uh, Philadelphia Daily News. And then went on to the Washington Post, um, where I know I followed his work, and later at Rolling Stone and elsewhere, where he was a writer of uh, remarkable political coverage, the 2008 presidential campaign, wonderful cultural and political features, an interviewer and writer of depth and grace, um, who then a few years ago, a couple years ago now, startled the world by outing himself, by coming out as an undocumented immigrant to the United States, telling his story in the New York Times, uh, and then founding a group, Define American. Um, I'm not going to say much more than that. Jose will talk for a little while, show a little bit of his new work, and then he and I and you will all have a conversation. We'll take it from there. Um, sir. Oh, you don't need to clap, but thank you. Um, it's really wonderful to be here, uh, as Bruce has said. So this is like, I was, I grew up in Mountain View, California, actually where Jose is also from. You have two Jose's, Latin Jose, Asian Jose, just, just so you know the difference. <laughs> but yeah, so he and I actually went to the same high school. Um, so I grew up in Mountain View, and then four years after coming to America, I found that I was undocumented, and a year after that, um, I just fell into journalism because my English teacher said I asked too many annoying questions and I should do this thing called journalism. I come from I come from a house where we didn't have a book, so I didn't really know what writing was. I was a horrible writer, um, but I became a journalist because I saw myself on a piece of paper. That was literally when I found out what a byline was that your name is on a paper for somebody who's undocumented who doesn't have papers. That was a very kind of like, hey, if I'm on the paper, that means I actually, you know, exist. So that's why I became a journalist. Um, I literally just fell into it. And I did that for about 14 years. Um, and my coming to Philadelphia in 2001 was really interesting. This was like, I call it like the age of innocence because it was before 9-11. <laughs> um, and this was the first East Coast city I'd ever visited. And if you grew up in the Bay Area where Jose and I are from, it's predominantly Latino, predominantly Asian. So you to come to a place like this where it's like black or white was just like startling to me. Um, I went back to San Francisco and changed my major to African American studies after I got introduced to a guy named James Baldwin who's, who has a bookstore called Giovanni's Room right kind of in the center city area here. So this is a very special city to me. Um, I just want to introduce a couple of things, and then I'm really more looking forward to a conversation since I'm in a room full of, you know, media people. Um, as I said, I, I basically had spent my entire adult life writing and being on a piece of paper and lying about who I was in a field, our field, which is supposed to be about truth-telling, I spent you know, a decade lying and, you know, basically committing fraud. I mean, I remember when I got here in 2001, you couldn't have an internship without a driver's license. And I didn't have a driver's license. And I lied to the recruiter and I said I had one, even though I didn't. And by the time I showed up here, she was like, well, I thought you drove. I'm like, oh, no, I actually don't. And then I hitchhiked. Can you imagine hitchhiking your way in crime scenes? I took the SEPTA. I took the bus, I took cabs, and in three instances, I hitchhiked to like West Philly to cover a crime scene. And never once told the city editor, Kurt Hine, that I didn't drive. Because I was afraid that if I had told him that I didn't drive, they would 
might send me home. You know, those kind of like lies, right? So after all of that, um, after the biggest assignment that I had was profiling Mark Zuckerberg for The New Yorker, um, after that, I quote unquote, outed myself as undocumented. And w what's interesting to me, and I'm about to show you this first video, is originally I got bit by the video, the filmmaking bug in like 2008. I had just finished a series on HIV and AIDS in Washington. And a woman contacted me and said she wanted to turn my print series at the Washington Post into a film. So we spent about a year and a half filming that, and then I got really, really into film. So I knew when I, quote unquote, was about to come out of being undocumented that I wanted to capture what I was going to go through on film, but I was going to do a different film. My film was I was going to write, I was going to do a film on how undocumented young people were using social media. We're using YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to exist, to tell their stories. Like for many young people, these tools are just nothing but narcissistic cesspools of like, what did I eat yesterday kind of stuff. But for young people who are undocumented, it's actually a way to document who they are. So this is like this teaser that we did when I was about, when I was gonna do this film. Oh, actually I thought they were gonna control, yeah. We need to solve this problem. And illegal immigration. Illegal immigrants. Illegal 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 come from Mexico. Mexico. Angel from Island immigration. It is a national security issue. We are not racist. 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 Hey, I'm 21. 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 Hey,
So I was there for like a month, right? Iowa has 99 counties. I've been to like every single one of them. So then I come back four years later um, and as an undocumented person for the first time in my life actually holding a sign and to crash a Mitt Romney rally. And I think you're going to see kind of what happened. So here's a clip from the film. This was a country where individuals who pursued education as much as they could and worked hard and were willing to take risks would be able to create, enter create enterprises that would lift them and provide rewards for them and lift the entire nation. And we've used our prosperity to provide for freedom for ourselves and to help provide freedom to others. No other nation on earth has done so much to provide freedom to others as the United States of America. There's nothing wrong with America that needs transforming. I want to restore America. I want to turn around America. Yes, sir. Do you have a plan on the part two of immigration? Because I believe there's immigrants here illegally that are honest, they're trying to work, they're doing right things. There's those people out there. Do you have a plan that could, could assist or help them in their need rather than just rounding everybody up and taking them car blanche, which I think is just as wrong as amnesty. So, yeah, my, my view is that people who have come here illegally should not be treated with favoritism in becoming permanent residents or citizens of the United States relative to those who've waited in line patiently in their home countries. So that's the principle. That's, that's the principle. And for those that have come here illegally, they might have a transition time to allow them to set their affairs in order and then go back home and get in line with everybody else. And if they get in line and they apply to become a citizen or get a green card, I'm sorry, I'm they'll be treated like right. everybody else. They I'm start at the back of the line, right. not at the front of the line. That, in my view, is the course that we're going to have to take. Thank you. I'm Jose. Nice to meet you. You have a brother, Jose? No, I do not. Are you in line? I just sir, have your no, but, but, sir, but sir, there's no line. I, I was brought here when I was 12. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't have papers since I was 16. My grandparents, who are American citizens, didn't tell me. So I've been here. Yeah. I've been paying taxes since I was 18. I just want to be able, as you said, to get legal, to get in the back of the line somewhere. And I think Romney made a point. Yeah. We want the highly intelligent immigrants here. Here. Contact if you're here, who's undocumented? There's no way for you to get in the process. Therefore, go to Mexico. You would be. Oh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm Filipino. Oh, Filipino. The Philippines. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Well then, but you know, you yeah. never looked at the immigrants. Why don't you become legal? Because there's no way, sir. Why? I used to work at the Washington Post. I won a Pulitzer Prize uh. at the Washington Post. Um, and there's no way for somebody like me to get legal. And this has been my home. We have a daughter-in-law who came here from Britain. Oh, yeah. As a science researcher. As a researcher, yeah. And Has she got papers now? Yes. She does Oh, now. that's great. She's been here 10 years. Yeah, and yeah. she was about to become exported. Why? Because she didn't have a green yeah. card. Um, I would think if, with the credentials you just Oh, no, no, ma'am. There's no, I mean, believe me, I wouldn't be here oh, if. But let me tell you. There's no way. Our daughter-in-law's no. credentials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what did it. That's what did it. And we got we got Senator Grassley involved. Well, I tried we contact it. Contact Grassley. Yes. Well, I, I came you know I, I came out as undocumented six months ago. So go. Uh, no, ma'am. Senator Grassley. We, we talked office. to Senator Gerben, and this is not something that can just happen. I know, um, but we've been through this. Oh yeah, no, I I've, I've been yeah. undocumented since I was twelve. There's. Uh, thousands of other stories like mine and again we're here we want to be tax-paying citizens we are tax-paying people what do we do with us I'm so this is this is what I, this is what I want to talk about so you haven't talked to Grassley yet um, I'm not do I'm not protesting I'm not no I'm not uh, yeah so I'm gonna stay I'm not causing any ruckus I'm not I'm simply asking a question 
Okay. This is the man that owns the business. He's asking you to leave, so let's walk towards the door. Oh, okay. Please. Um, Thank you. All right. Walk this way. I'll talk with you as we walk. That's fine. Are you, uh, you're a police I'm officer. Cedar Rapids police officer. Oh, okay, great. I'm Jose Vargas. I'm Mark Ian. Nice to meet you. There's a door right over here. Where is it? Right, right over this way. Right over that way. That brown door we closed. That was a good question. Thank you. You're welcome. Um... What happens when I throw you out? Well, I mean, you're, th you're basically throwing me out of there because it's a private business, That's you said. Correct. Yes. Yeah, so are you arresting me? No, no, no. I'm just asking you to leave the property. Okay, you're not arresting me. Okay, that's no, good. No, 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 no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm going to ask you. To By the way, I'm property. curious. So, what happens when somebody in Iowa, like, you know, if you discover as a cop that somebody's an undocumented person, somebody's an undocumented immigrant, do you do anything? or? Sure, we do. We, we uh, identify the people yeah. and then we contact the. Uh, or Homeland Security ice, to ice. ICE and see what's going on. Are you going to do that? No, sir. Thank you. I'm just going to ask you to okay. get in your car and leave the property. And I appreciate your cooperation and your peacefulness. Well, thank I'm you, sir. I'm carrying out the wish for Okay. You have to leave the property, though. Okay? Oh, yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so I'm just glad, like, the young intern I had didn't drop the camera. <laughs> the whole time I'm watching the footage going, oh, man. Um, so I, I want to bring up two points really quickly. One is, as a journalist, you know, I've been trained my whole life to not write about myself, <laughs> to get out of the way, right? Like I had spent, you know, I'd written like 800 stories, news articles, maybe three of them have been first person. Um, this has been incredibly uncomfortable for me to kind of insert myself in this capacity. And I remember, since I'm in a room full of journalists, it was really interesting because this was the first time I had ever held a sign anywhere, right? And I remember when this was happening, because what ended up happening was it got reported that, hey, Rami kicks Vargas out of the rally. So then it got, you know, written up and stuff. So as this was happening, my, my phone on my pocket was vibrating. I don't know if you could tell how nervous I was about all this. Um, and I had some colleagues of mine who I used to be reporters with on the trail really, literally texting me saying, what the hell are you doing? My friend who's a reporter at the AP, I'm not going to name him, says, what are you doing pulling a stunt? Like, have you, like, you've really crossed the line now, Jose. Like, this is crossing the line. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, first of all, I've always told that I wasn't supposed to be anywhere. So my whole life has been crossing things. So I don't really know... But it was really interesting, this, this question of objectivity, right, that we love to protect ourselves from. Um, and for me, I think the biggest gift that journalism has ever given me is empathy, the gift of empathy, um, of being able to, you know, cover Sarah Palin in Ohio for a week and try to figure out what people see in her or how she is without passing any sort of judgment, but just figuring out why people think why, they, why people think what they think and meeting people where they're at. Meeting people where they're at. And in some ways you'll see that in this next scene, uh, which is a scene in Alabama that was also, is also part of the film. A new illegal immigration law that's said to be the toughest in the nation is on the books in Alabama. The law will allow officials to check the immigration status of students in public schools and give the police new powers to determine whether someone is in the country illegally. But it goes beyond the legal issue. In part, what happens next to the 4% Latinos in Alabama and to the rest of Alabama's immigrants depends on whether or not this starts being treated in Alabama as not just a demographics issue, but as a civil rights issue. So can you tell me a little bit about how this has impacted you personally? Like, do you know people who are undocumented? I do. I do know some people who are undocumented. Um, and um, I know people who are documented. And it created a level of fear for them. Where, you know, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, you should never fear your government. The government should fear you. Where this produces... Just stuck straight up, dude. I've been hearing you all night long. Yeah. You sound like garbage. It sounds like you're doing an impression of Judy Paul. So you agree with it? So you agree with it? So you agree with the immigration law? Yes, I do. Get the motherfuckers up out of here. That's what I agree with. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. 
Get your papers or get out. I'm what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. You got your papers? You got your papers? What if I told you I didn't? Well, then you need to get your ass on then. That's what I say. Okay. Yep, that, that would be my response. Yeah. No, we're not going nowhere. I'm chilling. You shut up. Quit being a shit ass. Shut your face. Don't embarrass me. So you took the steps that served before you're not a safe There is no, there's no steps. There Dude, is a couple steps. Like what? There's no steps, man. My mom wanted to give me, I guess, a better life. I was 12. So right. she sent me to live with her parents in California. All right. So you I guess... There, you live with them? And... Yeah, I lived with them. Then I found out I was illegal. And then I'm like, shit, I better speak English well, or else they're going to think I'm illegal. I'm going to work my ass off. Work to the Washington. So, 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 so. I've been paying my taxes so since I was 18. I've been paying my taxes since I was 18. Well, good, good. That's good, good man. That's great. Thank you. Good picture. Well, okay. Security. <laughs> but the, the thing is, though, you, you kind of, you, you came over here and you, you became a productive member of society. Yeah. All right? That's well, what you did, I, right? Everybody wants to be, right? Everybody wants yeah, to be. Everybody productive. does. Yeah. Everybody does. Yeah. And when you got somebody, when you got hordes of people coming over here and they're staying 10 deep in their fucking apartment and they're lowing down like you know i'm a contractor i'm a blue collar guy it's not baby i build houses you know oh. what i'm saying when you got somebody yeah. put a roof on a house for ten dollars you got another one that's got to do it for about Brianna. 20 or 30 dollars yeah. I own 32 acres here. And are you born and raised here in Alabama? Yes, yeah. born here and raised in Alabama. I don't farm on the scale that I did at one time for the simple reason that uh, I'm getting older. <laughs> Paco is the nickname of my Latino worker. and It's a friendship and uh, he works for me, with me also. I'd rather say he works with me yeah. than, than yeah. for me. But, if I go to Paco's house, his three children come hug me just like my grandkids come hug me. That's that's one of his little his little son, oh, the wow. youngest one. But I, for some, I've accidentally erased the other. But Latinos are are scared. Uh, if if they're here illegally, they're scared. If they're here legally, they've got family members that they're scared for. But the idea that if I've got Paco in a vehicle with me, then I'm I'm liable also, and I, and I can be arrested. Well, that that's telling me who my friend, the state of Alabama, telling me who my friends can be. I'm a conservative, and I'm a hardcore Republican, but I don't don't agree with them on this. I th I think you've got an immigration problem, but this this is no way of solving. Um, so I should just say, can you imagine the young woman who was holding onto the camera as a drunken guy? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, her name is Ann Lupo, um, who Ariel knows. Um, so she started off with me as kind of like an intern, and then I actually just made her a co-director of the film because she had been with me for like a year and a half. Um, and then the film, so you saw like kind of two, I call them like public, you know, episodes. Um, what you're not going to see and what you'll see on CNN. So CNN just bought the broadcast rights of the film. It'll be on CNN sometime in May. The whole film, it's an hour and a half long. Um, so the film actually goes where I can't go. So I sent Anne and a couple of other people um, to the Philippines to film my mom. So I haven't seen her 20 years this past August. Um, as a lot of other you know, un undocumented people who are separated from their family. I mean, you hear horror stories from people who can't go to their father's funeral or grandmother's funeral or something like that because they can't get a visa, the parent, you know, all of that. Um, but this was my way, again, of like, you know, the title of the film, by the way, is documented. Again, you know, documenting the undocumented experience. Um, before it goes on CNN in May, we'll have a theatrical release across the country. And the struggle with documentaries, as you all know, is usually it preaches to the choir. You know, they show documentaries in New York, LA, and San Francisco, and Chicago, and Philadelphia, which is great. But they really need to show it in like Mississippi, and Alabama, and Iowa, and Lubbock, Texas. So our goal in the next couple of months is to have really strategic um, screenings in places that need to see a film like this. Um, so the last thing I want to say before Bruce and I begin is I, um, I cannot think 
of a more exciting time to be a journalist. I cannot think of a more exciting time to be a journalist. And I cannot think of a more important time to be really good at what we do. I feel like we're living in this tremendous age of positive disruption. And I think that we as journalists and storytellers need to kind of disrupt not only the kind of stories we tell, but also in the ways we tell it. Um, and challenge our editors as much as possible. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started with this. Really intriguing that's a film there. Oh, oh uh, thanks. Fabulous. Um, let me just start by asking this because I'm sure people in the room are going to want to know. Can you to quickly summarize your legal situation now and how, where things are for you? Well, I mean, so I'm still undocumented. Um, I didn't qualify for, there's a thing called deferred action for childhood arrivals the, that Obama announced a year ago. Unfortunately, I was four months older when they announced it. I mean, in terms of the cutoff. Um, right now, there's two things we're trying to explore. Um, because of what happened with the typhoon in the Philippines, they're now, they may offer temporary legal status to Filipinos in America. So it's one way. The other thing is the Defense of Marriage Act just got lifted. So undocumented people can actually now marry their, you know, marry and find somebody to marry. So I'm looking for that. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like that was never an option. So now it's like an option. So that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, so I'm still kind of in limbo waiting for, you know, immigration reform to actually happen. So since you came out and started this advocacy work and a different kind of storytelling. See, well, I don't, I, well, I, 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 you know, it's really interesting to me since I'm amongst friends. Like, I really want to push people about this. Like, yeah. It's weird, because now I get called like activists and advocate. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing what I've always done. It's just more honest. You're do, you are doing, you're still doing the work of journalism. It's, as you, far as I'm concerned, you're still, I am. You're still, yeah, you're yeah. still doing, you're still storytelling. So how has, and we can, we can talk about that, I think actually, because one of the big challenges is how to get unrepresentative, unrepresented mm -hmm. voices into the stories of journalism, and one way to do it is for people like you to come out. But how has your understanding of immigration and the country's immigration dilemmas evolved over the last couple of years? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, I am a reporter at heart. I, I kind of, I'm, I'm like a walking New Yorker article. You know, I like over-report, I overwrite. That's always been like my weakness, probably. Um, so the funny thing about this is, in my 10 years as a professional journalist, I did not want to touch immigration. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, get, you know, and my name's Jose, and you all have been in newsrooms. There's like one Jose, if that, <laughs> in a newsroom. So I was like, let me out, get me out of immigration. I'll write about AIDS. I'll write about video games. I'll write about whatever, just not immigration. Because I just didn't want to touch it. Because again, conflict of interest, whatever. Um, but now that I've been so involved in it, personally, of course, and professionally, it's been interesting to me how we've been enabled to connect the dots, right? Um, so the 1964 Civil Rights Act happened a year after the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act happened. Those two things happening right next to each other. If it's not for the Immigration and Nationality Act, the country wouldn't look the way that it does. The country wouldn't be nearly 50% of kids under the age of 18 in America are not white. They're mostly Latinos and they're mostly Asian. How did that happen, right? And if you know about immigration, you know that there are 17 mil million households who are mixed status households, meaning that most of the 11 million undocumented people actually have relatives, if not their own fathers and mothers, who are undocumented. So we've divorced immigration, I think, we, we, we as journalists and storytellers have failed to connect the dots between immigration, diversity, and demographics and how, how that has shifted. And a lot of that has to do too with how really not diverse our own newsrooms are. 
I mean, I remember being at the Washington Post for five years. I don't think there was a single Latino editor. And I was like, how did that happen? You know? And, it, and I think now we're getting to the point where you know, it's really weird for me because I, again, I grew up in newsroom, so it was, it was and it is my church. Um, and I've always been really afraid to criticize it. <laughs> but now that I'm outside of it, I feel <laughs> in a better position to politely and respectfully um, challenge kind of my own colleagues when it comes to that. One of the things we were talking about this morning before you came was the, the challenge for journalists in telling the stories of people who have a lot to fear, um, of yeah. undocumented immigrants or even, uh, even more or less legal asylum seekers who have a lot to fear here, who have a lot to fear in other places. Um, I was really struck watching the first clip with the number of folks you had coming forward who, like you, are holding signs saying, I'm undocumented, I'm yeah. undocumented. What is, what is going on that's allowing you and others to break silence around an issue that has been traditionally one filled with fear, uh, filled with a lot of trepidation about engaging openly, honestly, in a political debate? I mean, I would say technology has had something to do with this. Um, you know, like, I don't want to, like, put Jose on the spot, but, like, Jose was actually, like, one of the very first undocumented people I had ever met. Like, he came to a premiere of the AIDS documentary that I did in San Francisco. Was that 2009? 10. 10, 2010, yeah. I mean, I spent most of my 20s not knowing somebody like younger who was undocumented. Um, I just didn't want to, I just didn't want anything to do with it. I Google alerted it. Like I've been Google alerting immigrant, you know, the, the Dream Act since Google alert was invented. I think it was like 03. Uh, but I just didn't want to know anybody who was. So the more I met undocumented people, the more I felt compelled to, the more frankly ashamed I got. Um, and then I started, you know, I would read articles on people on the New York Times and then I would friend them on Facebook. And then all of a sudden their lives become open to me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a scholarship. I'm doing a rally. I'm doing, I'm like, while they're doing that, I'm, you know, I'm at the Huffington Post working for Ayanna Huffington. You know, I was like, I felt like such a coward. Um, so I think the fact that people are coming out, I think we have to think about that in a different way. And I've been, I've been doing a lot of thinking, as somebody who's also gay, about the intersections of those two things, um, coming out as gay and coming out as undocumented, and the, the, the whole idea that people don't really come out, they just let people in, right? Like, coming out is your prism. I've come out to you. As far as I'm concerned, this is my life, yo. <laughs> like, this is not out to me, <laughs> you know? And I think that's really interesting, especially in newsrooms where you still have the majority of editors being heterosexual white men who whenever a person of color comes up or a gay person comes up and talks about a story idea, it becomes, well, you know, that's advocacy journalism. Or, you know, you're writing about underrepresented. They're only underrepresented because you're not representing them, <laughs> you know? So as more people tell their own stories, right, what happens to us? Like, do we become synthesizers? Do we become facilitators? Like, so I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and frankly, as, you know, as somebody who's you know, it, indebted to journalism, I find these questions to be really important ones that I don't think we grapple with as much as we should. The country will only get gayer. <laughs> more and more people will only come out. It's only going to get browner and more Asian. Mm -hmm. So uh, what does that do then to our journalism? How do we reflect these quote unquote underrepresented people um, who aren't the minority? As far as I'm concerned, my whole life, I've been led to believe that I'm a minority. I'm actually not. Like I'm a majority of one <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> you know, as are all of us. And so how do we, you know, 
I'm trying as hard as I can to like, and in a way this film is my way of doing that. I'm actually working in the next couple of months on my next film, just starting to research more. I'm doing a documentary on whiteness. I'm doing a white documentary. So I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from the room, I'm, I'm sure I have some other stuff, but who? Uh... Please ask me questions, uncomfortable That's... questions. Things. This is kind of more related to journalism than immigration, per se, but can you talk at all about your um, transition from print to documentary work? It's so fascinating. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to write an essay pretty soon about the difference between, you know, I had written about my mother before, for example, right? When I, quote, unquote, came out of the New York Times Magazine, I... It was so funny, I had to like call my mom and like interview her about what happened that day when she put me on a plane and off I went. Because I, I was 12, I didn't really know anything about that time, right? And so I wrote about it, and then I had to film it. And the difference between the two mediums is really interesting, right? Like in writing, I can kind of make anything possible. <laughs> I can make anything possible. Film is a very literal medium, you know? Um, and so I'm still grappling with, so my friend who's an editor who wants me to write this essay, he's like, so what do you gain, what do you lose? Like, what do you gain in writing, what do you lose in writing? What do you gain in filming, what do you lose in filming? So I think that's really, really interesting. From a technical perspective, I wish I had known Final Cut Pro a lot sooner. <laughs> I mean, you know, I spent, we had about 160 hours of footage, can you imagine, that we had to edit in five months to a 90 minute film. Um, so it was crazy. And it was just like a crazy experience. Um, and if I'm a journalist now, which is why, man, I wish I was like, you know, in my 20s. Um, look, at the end of the day, not everybody can be everything, right? I think at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what kind of storyteller do you want to be, right? And how do you tell a specific story? Like, like one thing, by the way, that I have no experiences is radio. I love radio. Like, I wish that I could know more about, because I find the voice to be the most, for me, the most sensual thing. Um, and there are just certain stories that I think that lent, it's, that lent itself better to radio than TV, than, than video. And so kind of asking myself these questions. But I wonder if I'm in a journalism school, are they teaching this? Are they exploring these things? Like, uh, I'd be curious. What, what, what made video in this case especially appealing for you as a vehicle for telling this immigration story? I mean, it did seem to me well yeah. suited, but I'm not sure why. Tell me, tell me what was in your mind. Because you know, I'm really uncomfortable writing about myself. I am, you know, it was one of those things where I have to like this. I have to write a book, and like I just I have a deadline, and oh man, it's like. All I'm doing is like, all I'm doing is like rereading Baldwin and Didion. That's all I'm doing right now. It's like rereading them, just like, okay, how do you get comfortable using I? You know, like how do you get comfortable? So I think the filming for me was really interesting because it allowed me a level of intimacy that I didn't personally have to like, you know, for me this film, for example, in, in, in the film, we filmed the first time I Skyped with my mother, right? So we captured me Skyping with my mom, my mom for the first time. I could not have written that. <laughs> like, there was just no way I could have. And yet, the film shows that in such a way that is like, and, I, and you know, as, as, as you can tell, I'm still trying to like process this. Um, but I guess the bottom line becomes which medium is best suited for which story. Mm -hmm. those, those are the kind of things I'm asking myself. Other thoughts, yeah. So um, bear with me, because I'm going to make an obnoxious analogy here. Oh, no, please. Um, a lot of what we're talking about really doesn't apply to the newsroom I represent, which is Aldia Newsroom, which is mature. The what newsroom? I'm sorry. Aldia. Oh, okay. Aldia. And so, you know, the editor is a Latina. The majority of us, there are gringos and Latinos. It's a very diverse um, newsroom. And we've been covering immigration from the ground up for as l probably longer than you've had your Google alert on. Of course, I would only um, imagine, yes. And we're doing what 
this workshop, some people here have, have spoken of getting, you know, uh, talking to the people that it affects. But one of the question that um, interested me that you asked Jose was about how um, all of a sudden we're seeing people who are uh, undocumented people who are unafraid. And I wanted to ask you, Jose, if you think that that they all, by and large, are young. Mm -hmm. They're all, by and large, educated or in the process of being educated. Yes. They are all, by and large, middle class. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any of that, let me stand up and say I'm unafraid, from some of the people that we cover in the community, the baker who's got a family of, of four that, you know, is terrified that if he does come forth, if he's even photographed, he'd get the, he's, yeah. he's going to get deported. Go and, or the pastor who's been here 20 years and after being in a photograph in some paper then gets a deportation order. You know, I mean, I, th I, I wonder if there's actually a parallel between mainstream journalism and unafraid Dream Act age or Dream Act dreamer sort of undocumented people and sort of ethnic media and the sort of the hidden undocumented. And if there is, what is the bridge? That's so interesting. Well, the dreamers are the bridge. So let me answer this question in two ways. One, there's actually a scene in the film. Have you heard of a group called Dreamers Moms? You probably have. Dreamers Moms? So there are these moms that are the mothers of dreamers who got kind of inspired by the dreamers, their kids were coming out, and decided to form a Facebook group called Dreamers Moms. <laughs> and a lot of them, you know, are, I mean, I actually have met quite a few. A lot of them are house workers, day laborers. Um, and so they formed this Facebook group and they invited me to the first meeting, the first physical meeting in Miami. So I went because I wanted to film it. It's actually in the film. So what's interesting is when I went to the meeting, everybody started talking about like, hey, can we get more mobile? Because <laughs> they're like, I can't be in, my, in front of the computer all day because I'm working. So like maybe we should just be texting more instead of posting on Facebook. I thought that was really, really interesting because not everybody had a quote unquote smartphone, right? So that was interesting too. But to your point, I think what we're seeing, you know, the Dream Act movement is what? I mean, the, the Dream Act itself is more than 10 years old. I would say, and Jose can add more to this later. I think he's talking tomorrow. I think Dreamers started coming out as early as 2003, maybe even earlier than that. When YouTube hit, type undocumented on YouTube. I mean, it's like floods of people, right? Mostly young people. But now I think we're seeing that there's been a tipping point. I think there's been a tipping point. And I, I personally anecdotally can say this in the past year or so. Like, okay, you can't tweet this. Can this not be tweeted? Promise? Okay, thanks. Um, so on Monday, we're launching this video. We're launching a campaign on Monday at Define American, um, a pledge campaign. So the immigrant rights movement doesn't really have a symbol. It's kind of like, you know, the LGBT movement has the equal sign. The, the immigration movement doesn't really have an, a symbol per se. So we teamed up with this group and the symbol is, this symbol is a pledge. It's like a hand pledging allegiance. So to launch the campaign on Monday, I directed this, this PSA where I had 30 undocumented people pledge allegiance straight to camera. And I was very, very deliberate in wanting a housekeeper, a landscaper, you know, like, cause I mean, I think the dreamer story has been told, it will continue to be told, but if we are not broadening that, you know, talking about people's moms and dads and uncles, I mean, what's fascinating to me about the dreamer story is you're talking about a specific generation of people, right? Like I'm 30, Two, I'm about to be 33. Like, in some ways, we lo we've lost like a generation of people. I hear from people all the time who are like, hey, I'm 37. Yo, like, couldn't go to college, tried to go to community college, and then it didn't work out. I just, you know, became a janitor. I just heard this last week from a guy on Facebook. Like, that's why it's really, really important that we broaden the conversation outside of the Dream Act. Because the Dream Act is, the, in some ways, is the lowest hanging fruit that we can't even pass. So, how do we narratively try to kind of bridge those gaps? 
It's a question. Uh, when you decided to you know, come out as an undocumented citizen, uh, did it change your uh, perception about other people? You know, did it change your you know, sort of like observational sort of power as a journalist? And how did it change your writing as well? I mean, how did it change my what? Writing and you know the way you studied. Was so it like you mean change my of, like sense of emancipation or like freedom you got after that? And how did it change you as a person and as a journalist? You know, it's been really interesting for me because I have, you know, I have been very fortunate to build the career that I've always wanted. I'd always wanted to have the career that I had. I dreamed it. I never thought it would actually happen, but it did. But then when I quote unquote came out, it was so interesting how many journalists, colleagues, friends of mine were like, okay, well, you're not a journalist anymore. You're this other thing. And early on, I felt really <laughs> sad about that. You know, like I felt, sometimes I wish I would have like, you know, gotten a contract with a New Yorker where I was writing and like, hey, David Remnick, let me write about immigration for one year and then come out after I had written all those stories. What, did it, what difference would it have made, right? Um, I'm curious, I, I don't know the answer to this question. Like, as for my work, I mean, this has been an incredibly liberating, I feel like my career and my creative life actually just started two years ago. So that's been really great. Um, and the fact that I now get to define for myself what success is and what impact is. For many years, I was accountable to editors who I loved and you know, who were very nice to me. But somehow, whenever the question of audience or the question of, I had to fight for stories all the time um, because they were viewed as, quote unquote, you know, too controversial or too advocacy. Or, um, so that's really, really interesting to me. And so I think, frankly, I feel like I've gotten creatively better. Um, and, the, and the independence has been Stunning, you know, like being independent. I've always, I thought I was going to live and die at the Washington Post or, 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 or at the New Yorker. That's what, I'll, that's what I was going to do. Um, so the fact that I've become this independent person has been really, for me, like really liberating in an interesting way. I, I would also say that the, that sense of tribal rejection you may have felt from some quarters of journalism. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I mean, it's interesting because it parallels historically the experience that in the 1970s, the first feminist activists in the newsroom, the first women activists oh. had. God, I haven't studied that. That's really interesting. And parallels as well, I think, the early experience of the first journalists to come out as gay in mainstream news organizations. Oh, now you're an advocate, an advocate now. So I remember when you know. I was at the Chronicle in San Francisco and Gavin Newsom started marrying people, yeah. the editor at the time was like, hey, Jose, you can't write about that because you're biased. Yeah. And then I turned around and I said, wait a second, you're straight, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah. So aren't you biased? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so why won't you let us get married? <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's like, well, because, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, again, the glove has to be pulled from inside out, right? And frankly, I don't think we're doing this enough. We are not doing this enough. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the Dreamer movement and how it's become, um, it's, it's, come, it's like at a new level almost, uh, where you've had um, organizations like NIA, for instance, uh, bringing, uh, having these uh, um, National orchestrated- National Alliance. Yes, yes. yeah, sorry. Um, no, I was just having these uh, you know, orchestrated events along the border. I covered the first one out of Nogales. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. and so, uh, and, you know, now it's, it, there was one in Texas not too long ago. And they've gotten a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, heat for it from some uh, people in the immigrant rights circles uh, who've, you know, uh, who've, who've called them out and said that they're too uh, extreme and, you know, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that within the immigrant rights movement and, and whether you think that uh, Naya, the national, you know, th whether they've like shaken up 
the movement and, and, and for the better or worse. So how many people here cover immigration in your newsrooms? Okay. Like one of the most fascinating stories that never get written up as much as it should is just the generational stuff that's really fascinating. Um, and I can only answer your question as an African-American studies major <laughs> who like studied SNCC and studied like what John Lewis was doing versus like what Shuttleworth was doing versus what Martin Luther King was doing. And it's really interesting to me how you see all these parallels about how the generational divide in a way, right? And also the technological divide, right? Like a lot of the DC based groups don't understand technology in an anthropological way that a lot of these dreamers do, right? That have become real weapons. I mean, immigration would not be where it is. The dreamer movement would not be where it is right now if social media hadn't exploded in 2006. In the same way that the gay rights movement would not be where it is right now if Google didn't exist starting in the early 2000s. You, 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 ha you have to parallel the, the fact that more people in some ways are not only seeing each other but organizing amongst them, themselves. But I think within groups like NIA or United We Dream or Dream Activists, like, as far as I'm concerned, everybody is just trying to disrupt this, right? And I think the dreamers have done, and Jose, I'm sure, can talk about this because he's been at this longer than I have, like, um, not only disrupted the narrative, but also disrupted how the media reports on this, right? Um, and I think, frankly, I think we're still so we're still so close to it that I don't think we've had the the the, the reflection time. So when when the Nia folks started saying, "All right, like let's get people, let's let's self deport to Mexico and try to come back," I remember how many reporters tried to call me and say, "Hey, you should, you know, are you going to criticize this? Like, do you agree with this tactic?" I am not criticizing anybody in anything, you know, when it comes to, you know, underrepresented people trying to fight for survival, right? I think everybody's just kind of trying to do what they can. Well, that, We're probably out of time. That is a great place to wind up. Thank you, Jose.